Look at that. I'm muted. Thank you, chat, because uh, today's been a very long day. A little heat flashed out. It's like 110 where I'm at. But anyways, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Would have been really bad if I was on mute for the next hour and a half without noticing. But uh, let's get started without that. Um, now that we're uh, uh, on volume and on air. No, nothing's perfect, ladies and gents, but here we go. So today is going to be um, the first of many lecture series that I have planned uh, in the uh, for the rest of the year, actually, um, as I mentioned in January and around December time last year, one of the things that I wanted to start doing in the uh, coming weeks and months ahead, and I'm going to get started now that I have plenty of notes, not only just for Mr. Kennan, but other scholars, is, is that I wanted to do a series of biographical uh, lectures on international relations, particularly a lot around the aspect of the school of realism. So uh, in this channel, you guys know that I kind of follow the geopolitical school of realism, more specifically neorealism. I'm more of in that in that frame of reference. And we kind of know what that is. We've talked about it at length on this channel. We've done a whole lecture stream on what offensive and defensive realism means in sort of a structural realist context. But we don't know too often the scholars or the individuals behind it. And I thought, why not start with one of the most well-known individuals both of the Cold War, but also in shaping uh, American foreign policy during that time frame, but as well as his variety of works that illustrate the critical and realist school that came out of foreign service and later by Kennan's own mind and word after he was no longer in the foreign service. So today is going to be um, the first of three lectures on George F. Kennan. And uh, let me get my, uh, add this to, to stream here real quick and we'll start the slideshow. So uh, better that you all uh, have something to look at than just me. And um, so this is going to be an introduction to George F. Kennan. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with him, well, then you're in for a treat because this is going to be the first of three lectures on Kennan. Uh, this will start with his early life, his education, and the beginnings of his career in the foreign service, as well as his time during the Second World War. So uh, that's what we're going to start with this week. Uh, the next week will be more focusing on the infamous and well-known Long Telegram, his policy during the Cold War, his reaction after his time as the ambassador to Russia, along with his time as the ambassador to Yugoslavia. And then third and finally, we will cover the rest of his later life and works. And uh, I think I'll have praise of folly on to discuss one of his most famous books um, that is being known as American Diplomacy. And uh, when I say early life, I do mean his education and things like that, not your, your meme. Get that out of your minds. Um, so don't worry about that. So because this man has a long career and a long history of writings and works on policy, and he lived to be 101. This man was born in 1904. So, I mean, keep that in mind when we talk about this. Uh, so, again, I thought that it would only be right to do it justice if we had three streams on him. Uh, rather than just uh, one sort of very longish stream. There's just too much on Kennan. I thought that I could do justice with just one. So this will be the start of a series of streams, not just on Kennan's life, but we're going to also do this on everyone, um, other geopolitical thinkers and writers as well. We will probably do one in great length on Mackinder. We will probably do revisit Mahan. We will, of course, be talking about Stephen Waltz. That's almost required these days. Well, it is required in my personal point of view. Not everyone pays attention to him, I think, unfortunately. Um, they always focus on Mearsheimer, but not enough about Kenneth Waltz. 
But Waltz, Mearsheimer, Mahan, and Mackinder are the four big ones that I also have in mind for this lecture series. So um, if you wanted to know more about some of the great thinkers of contemporary foreign policy and realism, well, then you're in for a treat. So without further ado, uh, let's get started on today's discussion. Um, so this is, again, one third of uh, one third of the three lectures that I'll be doing. Uh, this lecture is going to cover George Kennan's early life, his early days in the Foreign Service. So we'll be talking about sort of his background, his education, uh, the early days of his Foreign Service, um, his later assignment to the Foreign um, plant Policy Planning Staff. I'll introduce the long telegram at the end, but we're going to spend a lot of time during the Second World War, the 1920s and 30s, and his background in education. Um, so a lot of people will like to say, um, you know, with the Ryan Gosling meme, he's literally me. Uh, I do, uh, he's literally me with this guy. So, and you'll see why, as I describe him, that, uh, why I view George Kennan to be a very personal hero of mine, but also someone that we should be paying very close attention to. So these are the things that I have in mind. This is a picture from George Kennan in the late 1940s post-war. And again, he was, um, getting up into his years. He was already 40 years old when this picture was taken, and he would live for another 60 more years on this earth, contributing to both academia, history, and a great understanding of foreign policy and international relations. So let's uh, begin our discussion today. So uh, the question is, well, who is this guy? Why do I view him with such a high regard? Um, so George F. Kennan was an American diplomat, biographer, writer, and political scientist. He has numerous published works, both in academic articles, journals, memoirs, books, historical reviews. The laundry list of his work is the reason why we're doing three streams. Um, but he was the first director of the Policy Planning Board of the U.S. State Department. So uh, the Policy Board was sort of the U.S. State Department's inner think tank. Um, later had the uh, policy planning board as led by then George C. Marshall, and he was responsible for a great deal of the construction and task of the Marshall Plan under George C. Marshall. Um, being the head of the State Department's think tank, you would see why quite a bit of America's post-war policy came out of him. Um, he was also the ambassador to Russia, Yugoslavia, and a well-renowned foreign policy realist. He was quite critical of the Roosevelt administration, both during and after the war, as well as the Truman administration that came after. Um, and after his time leaving the U.S. Foreign Service, he would spend the rest of his life writing well into his 90s, um, to where he still kept a steady hand, according to John Gladys's biographer, until he was 93 years old. So this was a man who was quite studious in his mind, quite active in what he accomplished, both academically, but also in diplomacy. And one of the most important foreign policy individuals to study, probably alongside Colonel you know, House of the Woodrow Wilson administration, just because of how they shaped American foreign service. Um, and he would live, of course, to be 101. He would live to see the Bush administration. He would live to see the expansion of NATO. And in fact, very famously wrote against NATO expansion, as well as war in Yugoslavia, along with American intervention therein. So there's quite a bit that I do want to cover. And this is, again, just going to focus on his education, his family life, how this man became the man who he is, and uh, his impact during the war and or the Second World War, and then later the Cold War. So let's, uh, let's continue. So early life and education. Um, is someone already had pointed out in chat? Uh, no, this is not someone that we need to have a, a grave concern over that meme about. Um, George Frost Kennan was born February 16th, 1904 into Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and lived to be 101. He died in 2005. Um, he, uh, grew up to a mom that didn't, uh, live very long. In fact, she died only a few weeks after he was born. He was the youngest and uh, family relations were quite distant, in part because his father had him when he was 52 years old, and that left uh, Kennan more or less to have a relationship with his father that Kennan would write in his memoirs to be more akin to a relationship one has with his grandfather than his own biological dad. And to such a degree in doing so that he was left in charge of being more or less the man of the house while his father worked, um, he was uh, not particularly close with his father at all and was left more or less in charge of his sisters as they grew up together. Um, this left him lost within his own thoughts and studies, especially as his father would later remarry and he had no close relationship to his stepmother either. However, this left him with a lot of time to not only grow an actual relationship with his uh, 
grandfather's work, um, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but he was also one that was constantly lost in a book or just very introverted. This man lacked the social graces and the gift of gab, um, meaning that oftentimes he would be staring out the window or lost in a text uh, when during family reunions and gatherings, to which, as he says in his memoirs, he can remember his aunt simply telling him to stop thinking. Um, and as we have here, this is a picture of George Kennan when he first joined the Foreign Service in the mid-1920s. Um, but along with his distant family relations, they did have a great affinity, the same as his grandfather, uh, towards Russia. He was interested in the classical works of Russian literature uh, that would greater influence his career, but also it would be well known by his colleagues in doing so. Um, but being from the Midwest, he was sent off uh, by his father at age of 12 to St. John's Preparatory Academy. And from there, he would have a, a strong class consciousness. He was firmly aware of the fact that he was not um, like these other boys, uh, despite the fact that he grew quite well in his studies. He graduated uh, near the top of his class. He was a given class poet. He had quite a few academic accolades by the time that he had graduated. However, by being in the Midwest, uh, when he went to Princeton University, he felt himself completely at loss uh, inside this world of elite education and found himself quite alone and left alone in a library. He was not a part of any social clubs, no real fraternities, and found himself socially ostracized by those that were sort of bred for this sort of work. Um, Kennan himself, while I was lucky to get into Princeton and did quite well for himself, his academic career, um, as, as biographer John Gladys had said, was notably unremarkable despite decent grades. So uh, along with this, it was amidst uh, a numerous amounts of illness. His freshman year was met with a heavy bout of scarlet fever, which already significantly limited him from engaging in the social life and academic rigor. But uh, upon recovery, he found himself um, just working alone and finding himself with his studies. Uh, and he joined the Foreign Service in 1926. And there's actually quite a bit to discuss in the U.S. Foreign Service at this time, which we're going to talk about next. So, as I mentioned that he was one of the few to have uh, joined the Foreign Service in 1926, I'm going to take a step backward, and we're going to talk a little bit about a well-known piece of legislation. Um, yeah, St. John's in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> So here we go. Um, but uh, like I said, one of you to join the Foreign Service in 1926. So a little bit of background. The Foreign Service was substantially reorganized, both led by efforts to modernize it by Colonel T. House uh, in the Wilson administration and those that had succeeded him. Um, to the, the right is a picture of Wilbur John Carr. This man is well known in the history of the United States State Department, having served 47 years inside. Uh, he was actually in Germany of the time when it was, uh, you know, when the war really began and the invasion of Poland started in 1939. However, Wilbur John Carr was adamant that the policies of the State Department, its consular and diplomatic services, uh, they needed to be modernized. And he worked very closely with a congressional representative. Um, by the name of John Rogers, hence the Rogers Act, uh, which was passed in 1924. The policy was proposed to provide keen competition and a professional consular and diplomatic corps. Um, this was the last part of a series of post-World War I legislations on modernizing the U.S. Foreign Service. Like I mentioned, uh, so sort of spearheaded by Ro Colonel House in the Wilson administration, whom we will do a future stream on because um, I know Thomas 7-7 has talked about him at great lengths. He is a man that we should be well familiar with in the history of U.S. foreign policy. So there will be a stream on him in the future. However, um, it was meant to have career organization by competitive testing. This became the formulation of the Foreign Service of the United States of America. Uh, consider it sort of the streamlining of consular and diplomatic services, along with creating a more centralized bureaucracy for the State Department to manage its goals and diplomatic appointments across the world. After all, by the end of World War I, the United States had become a preeminent foreign power uh, on, on the world stage. It became a great power. It was the one of the few Western countries uh, that had been untouched by the war uh, in terms of material damages and significant loss of men due to its late entry, um, and of course not being subject to any foreign invasion or trench warfare alongside its countryside. 
Um, one of the things to keep in mind, of course, about sort of the history of America rising to a great power, which I know Ryan Turnipseed and Radlib have done a great job covering in their Rise of Empire series, is, is that America's really only dealt with the War of 1812, the revolutionary conflict that led to its creation as a nation, and the war between the states. So really, there has been no foreign invasion or occupation, with a really notable technical um, exception of the, uh, Al you know, the Aleutian Island campaign uh, during the Second World War with the Japanese, but there was never really any direct confrontation. I mean, there was, but not to a, a degree that would require substantial deployment of forces or anything like that. Um, but however, this meant that the United States, post-World War I, really had to put itself out there. Woodrow Wilson became quite involved with the 14 points. And in turn, the Foreign Service had to reflect this post-war modernization, where America had a much bigger sway, both with its wealth and newly developed military. Uh, so this career organization and testing had meant that uh, the governance of the U.S. State Department required greater competition, a new crop of elites, uh, if you will. And in turn, in 1926, to George Kennan's surprise, uh, he was one of 18 new recruits uh, out of 1,000 applicants that had tested under the new Rogers Act, which went into effect in the late 1920s. So with that being uh, said, we can now kind of understand that this is just the you know forefront of this new evolution of foreign policy in America. Um, but Kennan's affinity for Russia, both in literature and history, um, was that of highly influenced by his father. Now, George F. Kennan is not the first George Kennan in his family. His grandfather, George Kennan, was well-known as a writer and an editorialist and a, and a journalist uh, at the turn of the century and worked with a man uh, named Frost, where he gets his middle name from, who was a photographer that accompanied the senior George Kennan around. Um, George Kennan was, at the time, the senior one, the grandfather, had implored the Wilson administration to join the Allied intervention and have an Allied intervention into Russia in 1917 in the midst of the Bolshevik Revolution and what subsequently the Russian Civil War. Uh, Frost and Kennan were well known in reporting this, and Frost's photographs can be seen uh, in various national archives in the United States about you know, some of the atrocities and the, the war had inflicted, uh, afflicted Russian civilians at the time. So along with his grandfather's work, um, his natural bookishness also led him to study uh, numerous Russian authors and their traditions, which would also shape his own views. He was not as egalitarian as many of that era probably were in the United States, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But um, this, in turn, would allow him to specialize his career towards more Russian-oriented affairs uh, due to the nature of his grandfather. Uh, and in fact, one of his favorite authors of all time, George F. Kennan, was that of Anton Chekhov. Having read all of his works, numerous biographies, and including um, numerous volumes of correspondence that were available biographically on Anton Chekhov. Um, so this man was someone who intimately knew bits about the Russian soul and how Russians thought, and you know, through the lens of their literature, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and others. So, um, but as I mentioned down at the bottom, he's sort of the uh, autist of the highest regard. So upon joining the Foreign Service and working closely at the time, I believe his name was Andrew Bullitt, who was the um, one of the ambassadors to Russia, uh, he was known for carrying a unabridged copy of the decline of the Roman Empire around everywhere that he went, and would often quote it um, at parties and other social events and meetings, sort of to illustrate that the man knew what he was talking about. But this is the kind of guy that would sort of let his... Uh, spaghetti slip out of his pockets when in, uh, chatting with other individuals. They found him to be a bit of an oddity, but a man who knew what he was talking about. Uh, so, you know, if you ever see anyone carrying around some thick books and just quoting them at nauseam, sometimes they're not a suit. Sometimes they really just are that autistic, and God bless our autists. And by now you can probably see uh, why I view him so highly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a, definitely a, a hip party trick. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there are better picks than Chekhov, but the, the man sort of knows him quite well and, uh, and do that. Um, but to continue on, I'm, I'm just, every time I'm going to finish a slide, I, I like to check with chat and see how everybody's doing, but, uh, we'll carry on. So like I said, he had an extreme fascination with Anton Chekhov. 
um, being the most well-known of the Russian authors and um, historians that he knew. It's not just Russian literature that he was familiar with. Um, he had read numerous other works as well. I believe he had also read Reflections of a Russian Statesman, and he had kept up with the diplomatic and historical correspondence of Russian diplomats throughout the 19th century in his readings and his studies. So you can see why, as I see here, given his family history and interest with Russia, he became the first foreign service officer of the United States Foreign Service of America um, to specialize in Russian affairs. So he is a trailblazer in a lot of ways, not just being the first specialist in a specific nation's affairs, um, but also with the Marshall Plan and the policy of containment, which we will talk about um, in the next stream that we do. But his affinity for Russian literature, their governance, their diplomacy, and their foreign policy towards the rest of the world, especially in antiquity and more contemporary for George F. Kennan's times, had led him to develop a rather uh, anti-democratic view of the world. Um, according to Walter Hickson, Kennan, Cold War Iconoclast, written in 1989, which is a really good sort of biography of his time during the Cold War, uh, as well as his writings, uh, had noted that Kennan uh, had a strong sense of duty, that elites are the ones that should be leading and governing society. The issue with lobbyists, special interests, and democracy is that it allows the public's baser interests to get involved. Uh, to a point where Kennan had said that he had openly preferred the rule of an authoritarian to that of democracy, um, something which his views in the 1920s and 30s was rather well known, despite the fact by this time, of course, um, FDR had just gotten into the White House. Uh, by 1935, he had been assigned to Riga, Latvia, and despite numerous requests, he was not allowed into Russia or be uh, allowed access inside of Russia with the ambassador's office. So for him, this was as close as he would get at the time in the 1930s. He viewed Riga, Latvia, where he was assigned, as sort of the window to the east, the opportunity as close as he could after um, the United States had officially recognized the Soviet Union in 1927, um, and what that would entail for understanding Russia better. He and three other individuals would keep a close tap on Russian affairs to understand their policy, their diplomacy, and how the Soviet government of the 1920s and 30s acted, which we will see in greater detail when he discusses this in the long telegram, the history and the political viewpoint and machinations of the Soviet Politburo and what they think in their own internal policy. Uh, however, though, this meant that his uh, authoritarian bent would also have significant issues when it came to future administrations and their foreign policy during the war. Um, however, this didn't stop him at all from expressing these views. He also was known for expressing viewpoints that would be uh, considered anti-Semitic, both during the 1930s, but definitely today. Um, and in turn, was very concerned that a democratic process meant that it would be difficult to have a... Uh, a sufficient foreign policy that could meet the needs and interests of the people and the people that govern it. So despite his class consciousness of being this guy out in the middle of the Midwest, his time in Princeton University, but as well as his time in the Foreign Service, had shaped his viewpoint that this isn't just a career, it is a way of life, that he was being entrusted as a patrician member of society, that he was a part of an elite that would determine the course of how a country conducts itself on the world stage. And he had lamented that his peers, again, this is coming from uh, Hickson's book, that many in the Foreign Service in the 1920s and 30s viewed this as a career and a way to have a study government check and a pension. But to Kennan's viewpoint of the world, it was actually the idea that this was something that should be attained, that we should be just as classy in terms of diplomacy as we would be in the tea room. We must carry ourselves in this language at all times. So this was a man who definitely took his job seriously more than others and believed that democracy was not a very efficient form of government and shared those views privately, both in his memoirs and other forms of correspondence. So uh, when uh, our friend Christopher Sandbat shared on Telegram that I was doing this, when we're talking about one of the good guys or one of our guys, uh, you can kind of see where he's coming from in this regard. But uh, definitely was a favorite of uh, rule by elites. He had favored old style aristocracies. He was skeptical of lobbying special interest groups, the ability for democracy to play into public opinion or even contort public opinion to take advantage of the public's base or instincts for war 
and get them to where they wanted to go, which may be against the interest of the country or its arist arist uh, aristocracy and its landed gentry. Um, but during his time in the 1930s in Riga, Latvia, uh, not only did they have access to preeminent communiques between the Americans and the Soviets at the time, but also had an inside view as to how the Soviet government was operating. This meant classified material in regards to um, you know, the rise of the Communist Party, how it operated, the uh, congresses therein that were hosted in the Soviet Union, and this would shape, of course, Kennan's understanding of not only how the Soviets operated, but really how the Americans should operate as well in regards to them. But uh, this isn't just the, you know, this is only the beginning, as I mentioned, of his uh, long-standing career inside of the U.S. Uh, Foreign Service. So come Operation Barbarossa, when the uh, our lovely mid-century Germans decide to go back on the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Molotov Pact and invade the Soviet Union and head eastward, creating a two-front conflict for the Germans, um, he was initially skeptical of offering aid to the Soviets. He did not want to uh, say that, that America should go alongside with what the British were doing and offering moral support as well as financial support to the Soviets. He argued that doing so and making it public would only, um, you know, harden the German spirit at the time and only encourage them to realize that they didn't, that this was all or nothing for them. He thought that this would be actually rather dangerous considering that this may only carve up Europe in the future and do varying degrees of spheres of influence depending on how the war played out. However, he was dismissed in 1942 from his post in Riga, Latvia, both during the war, but also because of his views in regards to being against um, working closely with the Soviets. Uh, he was assigned to a uh, ambassadorial uh, legation in Lisbon, Portugal. Now, during this time between his dismissal and his assignment, he had lamented that he wasn't like others, particularly like that of Mr. Bowen, which is one of FDR's personal translators and cur you know direct line of communications with the Soviets during the war, and he had found himself languishing. He felt that... He couldn't rise th through the ranks. He wasn't getting a bump in salary despite his years of service and his numerous personal costs of travel and expenses, and that he was left to languish inside these various administrative posts and to be stuck in some broom closet never to be seen or heard from again. However, Mr. Kennan is incredibly ambitious. And so alongside this dissatisfaction, um, he took the time to talk to um, the Portuguese king, who at the time was neutral and during the war, and was looking at the Azores, um, some few hundred miles to the uh, west of Portugal, and wondered if having U.S. air bases there might compromise the um, neutrality of uh, Portugal during the war. However, without orders, he went to Salazar himself and tried at best to persuade, and with significant success, uh, that the Azores bases would be returned to Portugal post-war. Well, we kind of know how that played out. Um, but because of this action, getting back to his superiors, he was recalled to the Washington in 1943 and was reprimanded by the Secretary of State, Mr. Stimson. However, the young diplomat at the time had a significant degree of success in talking to the president himself. He was a junior foreign service agent. He was not of any significant position of seniority, However, he managed to explain his position to FDR and his success in convincing Salazar that the bases would be returned to them, thus not to compromise the neutrality of Portugal during the war. Um, and in doing so, FDR had signed off on it and allowing him to continue on with his job in the Foreign Service without getting fired or recalled back into. So, uh, another piece of interesting uh, history about here. Um, Portugal, the appendix of Europe at the time, uh, indeed, and at the time also very neutral and trying to stay out of it, um, between the issues with Franco, which again, Kennan would be opting for both post-war uh, to actually change America's foreign policy towards Francisco Franco as the Cold War began to heat up. But again, more on that uh, next stream. So along with this, you can see that Kennan wasn't a man to simply take his post and not do anything with it or to keep his head down and to simply shut up. So one factor of many here. Uh, 
yeah, a, mo a high low dynamics monarchs and non aristocratic uh, or yeah, non aristocrat diplomats. So yeah, a man who didn't have much growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and being sent off to some prep school in Minnesota, you know, has a firm understanding of being a part of an elite class and uh, negotiating with them, despite the fact he had no orders to do so. And while Stimson significantly reprimanded him, threatening to end his career right then and there, um, he managed to, with great success, to convince Stimson to give him an audience with the president for a short amount of time to explain the success he had in convincing Salazar that the bases would indeed be returned. So, uh, quite a bit there for us to appreciate. Um, but, oh, the picture's not up there, but don't worry. Uh, I have quite a few more here to, to add on to, so we'll just let my uh, voice carry us the way here. Um, but after this time in Lisbon, he was assigned to Ambassador John Winnat, the ambassador to Britain, but was also a part of the European Advisory Commission. Um, this was sort of his way of getting more involved in the wartime affairs. However, his disagreement with the FDR administration and its foreign policy continued. He would later change his position on Lend-Lease, understanding that in order to achieve some term of surrender from the Germans, that it would need to have support in engaging in a two-front conflict to continue to weaken German military forces and to support the Soviet push further and further westward. However... He did oppose an unconditional surrender uh, between the Germans and the Allied powers. And in doing so, this would significantly get him uh, out of favor with FDR's administration. However, he did manage to secure, and this is where his, uh, this is where his autism kicks in once more. Um, when getting access to documents um, post, uh, I want to say post, yeah, post-1943, about what the future of the war would look like and what the future of Europe would look like at the end of the war, um, he noticed that the occupation zones driven up, uh, drafted by FDR for the end of the war were going to be in conflict with various Anglo-Soviet agreements on what occupied Germany might look like. So later towards the end of the war, the young Mr. Kennan manages to secure a second meeting with FDR, arguing that with great degree that, hey, according to our documents from Winat, and what we've seen and what the Soviets and the um, British have been talking about, that uh, we're not going to actually, um, th these, uh, these aren't in sync, these aren't in congruence. Our allies are going to be very upset with the American occupation plans that we have post-war, and we need to make sure that these things are in line. To which, after Kennan had explained with numerous pages of documentation, correspondence, and files that were carried along with him into the Oval Office, FDR had simply chuckled and simply said in regards to the snafu, quote, that these things were driven on the back of an envelope one time. So an illustration as to how something as simple as potential plans for future occupation can trigger his mind and see how that might affect his allies and the balance of power post-war in the region. However, once again, Kennan took it upon himself to explain in great detail uh, both to Mr. Winnat, but also he simply didn't inform Ambassador Winnat that he was talking to FDR again and went behind his back as being a part of this effrontery of going behind Winnat's back. Um, this pretty much led to his dismissal to a point where at the support of Winnat, as well as the State Department, uh, Mr. Kennan was offered a long vacation in late 1945, or in late 1944, excuse me. So that's sort of the end of his uh, wartime career here as well. Um, and the fourth bullet point that I had up here was expressing his uh, dissatisfaction with unconditional surrender. That fact would be used against him for his long um, vacation, his sort of dismissal from any official diplomatic standing. Um, because he had voiced his opinions to Winnat, um, and it was used also against him by Winnat and others working within the ambassador to UK, as well as the European Advisory Commission from the American side, um, this was used as ammunition to dismiss Kennan outright because the American foreign policy at the time, as described at the Yalta Conference and numerous others between wartime leaders, that the position for the Allies was an unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany. So because he was adamantly opposed to this and already had significant issues with working with the Soviets in the past, all of this ammunition had led up into his removal. Um, however... This wouldn't be the end of his career. So as I had mentioned before, at the end of World War II, given his understanding with the unique Soviet aspect, being a part of the specialist in Russian affairs and being one of the first, um, when George C. Marshall had begun to lead the head of foreign policy post-World War II, um, he, of course, was in part of the policy planning board. 
and in turn would be significantly responsible for crafting much of the Marshall Plan and how to rebuild Europe, specifically in mind as a military and economic counterbalance to the growing influence of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain. In 1952, under President Eisenhower, uh, well, right before Eisenhower was actually, so this is during Truman's administration, excuse me, uh, he was assigned ambassador to Russia in 1952. Um, but there's much more uh, to go before that. Um, during his time, yeah, 19, yeah, 1952. Sorry about that. My notes are all over the place now. I've gone through like three or four pages. Um, but in regards to the Truman administration and what sort of should be done in regards to foreign policy, in regards of America's policy towards Russia, as things were beginning to heat up, the post-war you know, lines were being drawn and uh, much of the territory in Eastern and Central Europe was being carved up by the Soviet Union for Soviet republics. The question became, what of American foreign policy towards the Soviet Union? And this is where we're going to get to the end of today's lecture um, and what that should be. Um, to the right, I have pictured here would be the same telegram, over 5,000 words in detail of Russian history, their interpretation, the Soviet ideology in regards to communism and its adversarial relationship to capitalism, and how they view the United States in particularly, uh, led to over 5,000 words being written as to what policy should be taken. Um, and this would later be published in Foreign Affairs magazine under Mr. X as to preserve the integrity of his position, but also to keep him in place uh, so this is not official State Department documentation uh, to keep his job, but also to protect the State Department. And I have this picture to the right, and I'll read it here. These considerations make Soviet diplomacy at once easier and more difficult to deal th with than the diplomacy of individual aggressive leaders like Napoleon or Hitler. On the one hand, it is more sensitive to contrary force, more ready to yield on individual sectors of the diplomatic front than when that force is felt to be too strong, and thus more rational in the logic and rhetoric of power. On the other hand, it cannot be easily defeated or discouraged by a single victory on the part of its opponents. And the patient persistence by which an animated means that can be effectively countered, not by sporadic acts which represent the momentary whims of democ democratic opinion, but only by intelligent, long-range policies on the part of Russia's adversaries, policies no less steady in their purpose and no less ver um, variegated and resourceful in their application than those of the Soviet Union himself. Again, this is where you can kind of see Kennan's realism, but also his uh, anti-democratic lens come in full force. Um, the article would be refined and taken into consideration basically from the telegram itself, but put in a more effective form, not just bullet points one, two, three, and four. Um, this telegram we are going to read a lot more of in next week on stream. And we're going to be discussing not only his ambassadorship to Russia, his time in Yugoslavia, this um, telegram itself, but we're going to basically break down his viewpoints on containment and eventually his dismissal from his Russian ambassadorship and his crit criticisms that would come um, during out the Cold War, including his opposition to being in Vietnam, his opposition to the concept of the domino effect, and what containment meant to him compared to those in the administrations that would follow Truman, Eisenhower, and others. However, this was the idea that we can see here. Um, not sporadic acts which represent the momentary whims of democratic opinion, but intelligent long-range policy. That this policy would have to be concentrated and against the Soviet Union at all times. It could not be reactive. It had to be there, present at all times. No less steady in their purpose, no less variegated or resourceful in their application than those of the Soviet Union itself. In order to be like in defeat to the Soviet Union, or to at the very least contain them and respond to them in full force, Kennan argued and believed that a policy that was as long-standing as that of Soviet premiership or those that could be in the Politburo for years, if not decades, the same needed to be applied by the U.S. State Department. And again, this is sort of a consequence that could only have been made through the more centralization and the modernization of the American State Department and its diplomatic and consular corps through the Rogers Act. Um, without the modernization led by House and others, uh, the U.S. State Department probably could not have accomplished this because the consular and diplomatic services were at the time separated. Um, but now everyone in the State Department could act, you know, jointly through these sort of memorandums by the president and the suggestions of the Secretary of State to be carried out by their Foreign Service staff, both as analysts, specialists, historians, you know, interpreters, and those that could understand the language. Kennan, of course, would be one of the most famous, and we're going to talk about that next week. 
Um, so some final thoughts in the end of lecture. I don't know why the fourth bullet point keeps disappearing because it's showing up on my screen. But anyways, uh, reminder, this is uh, part one of three. Next week will be his Cold War policy, ambassadorship to Yugoslavia, and his time outside of the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, this is a man of high ideals and lifestyle. He's bookish, yet highly articulate in his writings, uh, incredibly introverted. And in fact, he would often go on and do things, as we've seen already in the early parts of his career, to go pretty much without permission and to do things without orders. And uh, we're kind of seeing the worldview of a man that we've lost in thought and history. There are very few cold warriors that are still around. Um, many of them are no longer with us. For instance, Kenneth Waltz died in 2013, uh, whose work on American foreign policy and um, you know nuclear arms and nuclear policy would be influential and are still debated about to this day. But um, the idea of understanding and calculating the balance of power and how great nations and great powers act on the world stage requires you to understand their constraints, but it also requires you to understand how their ideology impacts them. Not specifically because Kennan knew so intimately sort of the, you know, not only just Russian literature in terms of fiction and its writings, but also because he had studied the diplomatic documentations and communiques of the 19th century. He had an understanding of how Russia would operate is that nation underwent the pseudomorphosis into, you know, the old Tsarist Russia to now the Politburo and communist Russia of the Soviet Union. And in turn, this would allow him to shape foreign policy, as we can see here, the sources of Soviet conduct in July 1947 um, is when the article would be published from his uh, long telegram in 1946. Um, these are men that we don't see too often these days. There are a few realists out there. There are plenty more that work not inside the foreign service, but you know they write a lot for foreign affairs magazine or they'll they'll write for foreign policy, but. Um, we, we see people like, you know, for instance, Stephen M. Walt or John J. Mearsheimer, um, men that studied Kennan, men that knew Kennan and had correspondence with him. Um, these men are, are, are much rare in breed nowadays. The liberal Wilsonian and interventionism of, you know, promoting fourth American values was something that uh, Kennan was adamantly against. And in fact, both in the book, uh, Around the Cragged Hill, but American diplomacy, Kennan makes it very clear that uh, this Wilsonian idealism, this uh, proponent of putting forward ideas is not good policymaking on the grounds that it can change based on whatever the definition of those ideals are, but also because they may not last forever. One man's foreign policy may be Wilsonian idealism and the next may not. And then they may change from administration to administration. And careful, meticulous planning is rather necessary for foreign policy and which requires you to take a more balanced and realistic approach. Uh, Kennan had wrote for years, both um, with his own institute, but also within his communications with other foreign policy staff and those that worked inside the State Department in an advisory role, both in personal communication and public, that more serious considerations of the balance of power must be kept in mind. Um, and we've already seen this both in the works of John Lewis Gladys, who is his official biographer, um, but also like that of those who had wrote about him, like Walter Hickson in 1989, especially as the Cold War was coming to an end. He was greatly concerned about maintaining a balance of power in Europe and was already opposed to a lot of what the Soviets were doing during the war, not just what the Soviets would do post-war, but also during because he had already had saw in his mind and his writings what the future of Europe would look like, and it would be a conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States and her wartime allies. It wouldn't be, you know, what many had feared about a, a resurgent Germany or um, other powers. It was going to be explicitly the Soviet Union from here on out, and that those caught in between, um, that balance of power needed to be very carefully maintained. And even though that would lead eventually to his dismissal as he sort of criticized the administrations that followed FDR. Um, this man, specifically with the sources of Soviet conduct, but also the, the telegram itself, would shape foreign policy regardless of his time inside the Foreign Service for decades after his time in government. So with that, I will remind you all that this is part one of three. Next week, we'll be covering his Cold War policy, his writings, his time in Russia and Yugoslavia. And from there, the third part will be covering a variety of his works, including 
around the Cragged Hill, where we get a more personal from his words on his political philosophy, his religion, his viewpoints, but also Praise of Folly will join me to discuss his seminal work, American Diplomacy. So, with that, I think we're ready to get towards announcements and uh, Frog of the Week. So, uh, announcements. I have, most likely, depending on how my stream schedule works out um, with how life operates, um, there will be no Sunday stream on the 31st, but I'm going to premiere the, the Garrett Garrett video. Um, I have just about all of the editing done for script-wise. I've got some of the recording audio finished, and uh, I'm going to try and make this a really, like, a higher effort production quality. I don't want this to just be, like... Um, sort of a slideshow with audio for you guys. I, I do have some things incorporated there that I, I want to keep in mind. I'll be referencing some Rothbard, but we'll be talking mainly about um, Garrett Garrett's writing and more specifically the revolution was. So before the managerial revolution uh, was written, for instance, Garrett in the late 1930s and 1938 wrote the revolution was as a political pamphlet saying that, you know, there's a lot of right wingers in America that are saying, hey, you know, things can change in this world. We have to stay vigilant. And he documents exactly how the, you know, FDR's administration had radically changed the uh, policy and the, um, you know, the, the inner workings of government inside America. The, the revolution was, it already came in the night of depression. Um, so Thursdays, uh, as I'm sure you guys noticed earlier this week, um, that is when Gio and I streamed um, The Digital Archipelago. It's a new show that he and I are working on. It's more of a culture show covering media, those of just other things that are not explicitly current events. And um, episode one is on his channel. Episode two is on mine. Episode three will be on his, or just to alternate on channels, because he's also monetized that way. Um, my super chats are his, or mine, his super chats are his, and things like that. And um, next week, uh, or this Thursday, actually, we'll be covering um, some Ryan Gosling movies, because everyone loves the meme. You know, he's literally me. So I think we're going to be talking about um, The Believer Drive and Lars and the Real Girl. So I feel like a, a good cross mix of just understanding the phenomenon of he's literally me. Uh, alongside with that, my Decameron Film Festival appearance, speaking of Ryan Gosling, is now available. Please see the community posts on the community tab on the channel. Um, I spent about 50 minutes, I spent about an hour talking uh, with Frody, and I hope Frody forgives me for making him watch La La Land. But um, we talked about La La Land and why it's meant to be this like love letter to Hollywood, but it doesn't meet up to what it wishes to accomplish. Um, Real Talk is in the works. Uh, I bought a new camera stand. Um, I actually wanted to record footage yesterday. And this is one of those like, ah, it's bullshit stories. But um, uh, I had used some live bait and, and some top waters and the, the fish were definitely biting. I had caught four and I'm reeling them in. I'm thinking my camera's recording. I'm literally taking the time to pause, turn and show to the camera. Like, listen, you people, there are fish in this pond. Um, and I finish up and I'm wrapping up and I, I walk up there and, uh, the, the phone has just got the camera on. It's not recording and, uh, anguish, just, just pain. So, uh, later today I'm going to go record again. Uh, and hopefully I will have the same luck, uh, as, uh, before, <laughs> if not neither here nor there. Um, I have a, I actually, this one will be scripted. I have this piece on, um, this concept of political archeology span that I think you all will very much enjoy. Um, on Subscribestar for patrons, uh, I have a post out there for July Q&A, so if you are wanting to have some questions that are just, you don't want to, you know, that you want to just ask about anything, you can literally just comment on that Subscribestar post, and, um, I will have a video for you all, um, that will answer all of your questions. So every month, you guys can spend all month asking your questions, and um, I will answer them in a video just for you all. Uh, I've heard, I've talked about everything about like the Mexican or the, the Texas, you know, revolution and its independence from Mexico to, um, you know, the ideas of just how do we talk to people and, you know, hiding your power level to various forms of religious questions as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a good way to get to know the people that have been kind enough to offer support for me. And if you are a channel member or a patron uh, on Subscribestar next Saturday, um, uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern, uh, we will have another Hangout stream where we'll just discuss some of the things that I'm working on, you know, hear from you guys, take suggestions on future videos and content to work on, and things like that. Um, the other announcement I do have is that um, 
um, I'm working on getting Morgoth on. Uh, he and I had a, a conversation uh, about fishing. So you're going to get a like much longer stream about, you know, man and nature and uh, the way of we can just lose our hours, you know, behind our, 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 our fishing rods and just being out by the water, out by the sea or out by the pond and lake. So um, I, I told Morgoth the reason why I wanted to have this discussion, and I'll probably tell this joke again when I stream it, is, is that I uh, wanted to have this discussion because I remember being on Unpopular Opinions one time with Sargon of Akkad, and we were, this, is in, this is backstage, and uh, Lambda asks me, well, did you li how, how's fishing prude? And uh, Sargon... gone to to start fishing take the fish pill and enjoy it so those are my announcements um if i have any more stream appearances i think there's um i've got one in august from the guys from new right the r w i t e right podcast and uh other than that i might do something with the guys at the american sun but again stay tuned and always pay attention to the community post and make sure that uh, notifications are turned on for you guys. I know that they're not the most reliant, which is why I try to post on the community tab and on Twitter and Telegram as often as I can. So let's uh, get to Frog of the Week. All right, uh, this week's Frog of the Week is the Ezo Brown Frog, um, native to northern Japan and Russia, as well as some parts of China, although the ones in China are more of an invasive species, the same thing here in the United States. Uh, their habitats are running streams, boreal forests, and grasslands, places with running water is where you're most likely to find them. Um, and of course, they are here in America, mainly along the East Coast in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. Uh, which the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has declared them an AIS, an Aquatic Invasive Species. So um, they are actually growing uh, in population quite well in the Pacific Northwest area. Um, and people who sometimes go to Japan and keep them as a frog or as a pet, and then they end up bringing them back. And well, you know, that's how things happen. Um, they do have a primary uh, diet of insects. Yeah, they do travel quite a bit to, to, to mate they are not as, uh, while they do like just, um, you know, running waters and streams, they do travel quite a bit for their meals when insects are not available. They will try and eat whatever they can, um, but they're not very big. They're about uh, two and a half inches from snout to the back of their legs uh, in full length as well. And in fact, they're not a widely photographed frog. Um, the one I have here is actually from a uh, just a random you know individual walking around on nature there does not too many official specimens or frogs actually kept um, but along with running water and boreal forests you can find them in grasslands and other heavily wooded areas and forests as well uh, which is why you can see them alongside the um, in parts of russia china and japan as well as other japanese archipelagos along the mainland so uh, but of course, due to the fact it's an invasive species, it's not facing any major habitat loss. Uh, it is listed as a species of least concern, according to Icoon, when it comes to whether or not the species should be concerned for its endangerment or how near or close to extinction it is. But uh, like every frog of the week, they're always special. They're always interesting. There are thousands of species for us to cover. So frog of the week will never end along with the show. So that is this week's frog of the week. And uh, we'll just catch up with uh, all of you all in chat for a little bit. Um, I want to thank, of course, all of my top tier patrons that I have listed on here. Fearless Leader, Raging Mandrel, uh, User 4A5B, 5DB5, Cowering Bugman, Preservatism, Focron, Consumer, and Hunger. You guys donate $20 a month or more on Subscribestar, which I'm incredibly thankful for. You guys make sure that, um, you know, the, the situation I'm in right now continues to be um, you know, it doesn't hurt my pocketbook. It doesn't hurt me when it comes to my medication or any sort of expenses like that. 
So you guys uh, really do all the great work. All of you on uh, Subscribestar or channel members, those that you know even just send me correspondence about what's going on on other parts of the world. For instance, I know Monothalmos isn't a patron, but he spends a lot of time messaging me about articles that you know about international news that may not make it to the Western media or you know makes it week you know weeks later. So he kind of keeps me on track of what's going on, and he's also sort of one of my inside men in Germany. You know, so I'm very thankful for when people go out of their way for that correspondence. And, uh, of course, there is the lovely merch store from Teespring. There's uh, shirts, socks, and uh, we're working on a hat. Um, we've got, you know, everyone likes the memeable, you know, um, fish want me, women fear me type deal. Those kind of meme hats about fishing. Uh, we're working on one. We're going to have one up very soon. Um, but in the meantime, you can always enjoy yourself uh, a lovely mug and what more to come. And uh, with that, I guess we'll just catch up with you guys because... Um, we've got our announcements out of the way and let me, uh, turn my camera on here and, uh, we'll just chat with you guys for a bit. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, there are wonderful frog of the week mugs. You can get one yourself. They come in two forms, this one and another lovely one called, uh, geopolitics and frogs every Sunday. So there's all plenty of great things to do. Um, uh, Michael asks about uh, all these events that uh, others have mentioned. So like the one we did in February and the, the one that is actually going to be happening very soon. Um, uh, that's just with uh, the Shieldings guys. So uh, S-C-Y-L-D-I-N-G-S, Shieldings. You guys can look them up. They've been uh, really good as well on that issue. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Uh, don't, please don't eat every bug out there. Yeah, don't, don't, don't eat all the bugs here, gents. Um, and for those of you who are wondering, am I on alternate forms of media? Yeah, I, I have an Odyssey channel. All things get auto uploaded there, and I do have an Odyssey exclusive, um, uh, talk with King Salmonfish that was rather interesting. He's more of a, you know, spiritual psychedelic individual who had some interesting takes on politics and world events. So, um, I will have at least one major uh, Odyssey exclusive coming up soon. I'm going to talk about Virilio acceleration and some of the, um, uh, you know, things that are currently going on, genetically speaking, that we'll talk about. Not just about, like, what we've seen medically speaking, but also, like, sort of, you know, the issues of fertility and endocrine disruptors and all that. Cause I think the argument can be made that in our pursuit of these new inventions, we've accelerated ourselves into a genetic Hiroshima, which is now this like 21st century, you know, genetic bottleneck. But I'll put that out there for you guys to see on Odyssey. Cause there's no way heck I'm going to put it on here. Uh, I like this channel still being on here, gentlemen. Um, but let's see here. Um, Oh, well, Bolero asks, how's the search going? Well, it's improving, actually. Um, there's a couple of city jobs near me that um, has been passed forward for serious consideration. So um, I should I have an interview this week, and then there's two more places that I need to fall through and call back and, and keep going with. But I mean, it's I'm not uh, I'm not too worried. I mean, the, the time I've taken to, you know, continue to, to find things and um work my way towards the success that I want to have and to find something that I think could provide a stable enough income to, you know, have a family and children. I'm, I'm not worried. Um, I know I'll find something. I know God will provide, but uh, I've also been very blessed by having people email me and call me up saying, well, you know, there's some remote work here and there. So I've got friends and this is where I'm going to say a big thanks to Paul Fahrenheit publicly in person. Um, you know, he's been a really good friend to me and he's also been helping me talk with people about potential remote work and jobs there with his work. And, uh, another gentleman had emailed me one of my like very long time, early Nike subscribers had messaged me about places that had some openings in Texas. So, um, things are going well locally, but you guys have just been so fantastic and kind to me. I really don't have any words about that. So it's going, I'm not worried. I, I, I pray and I have faith, but there are some good opportunities that have popped up that I think I can do quite well out just to have something stable and to allow me to have, you know, the income that I need, but also to, um, you know, allow me to pursue this as well. I, I do treat this like a job. You know, I, I, I record my hours and I, I have my own autistic, you know, viewpoint of how many hours did I put into this? How long is the video? 
How well is it being received? What are the comments like? How's the engagement? What do other people think? My colleagues. So these are all the things that come into consideration, but um, it, it, it's going. I, that's what I can say. It's going and I'm optimistic. Um, let's see here. Oh, I don't want to miss too many comments. Um, do I think it was a mistake to, to show it? No, I, I don't. Uh, I originally, I can pull this out now because the volume's over with, but um, uh, the reason why I'm not I'm not uh, opposed or I don't regret it is just because one, I think it's important for us to humanize ourselves. I mean, after all, we are regular people. We are human beings. And, uh, you know, I was inspired by Lambda, you know, Luke to do this. So I, I think that it's important that, you know, we, we do, you know, give ourselves some humanity. I think it's important for that regard. And I've talked about it at length about the need for us to have real connections, not just these sort of parasocial ones with just random, you know, private profile pictures where we're completely anonymous. There are value. There is value to it. I know that there are plenty of people who are still in on that I know nothing about that do great work and influence people. So, but for me, I think it's important in my regard of what I do and to provide some semblance of ideas and mentorship and communication that, you know, that you know what I, who I am. Uh, I do know that in regards to um, dressing up, I know that I caused quite a stir wearing my, uh, my stained Hanes t-shirt from our buddies at Queens Trash who write Cars and Women magazine. Um, the comments for that was just, uh, it was very scandalous. I saw someone say that I was like, one step closer to having like used car parts on my front lawn. So uh, lesson learned. We'll never, we'll never not be, uh, we'll never not be in a suit again. <laughs> but yeah, Dave, I, I, that was a lot of fun getting a lot of flack for that. Um, yeah. Praise of Folly will be on for the third stream. When we talk about a lot of his writings for uh, American diplomacy and round the Cragged Hill, but yeah, let's see here. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, I mean, it is challenging, Inquisitor Z, but at the same time, I'm I'm not too worried. And it helps to have, a, like, again, this is why it helps to have, like I've been talking about, a network of friends, community groups, and things like that. Because there's no way in heck, right? Like a year ago or even today that I would have been told, hey, you know, I can't help you. Oh, that sucks. You're sorry. But, you know, emails and phone calls and things like that from friends, it's just... Uh, it's quite a bit of uh, just, I'm very thankful and I'm very blessed. Uh, I don't say lucky or we're blessed, you know. But uh, I see everyone in chats talking about gnats. It's summertime. Yeah, it definitely, definitely sucks. But yeah, um, you do need, yeah, you do need real life friends. And once you meet people in real life and you do your basket weaving and things like that, um, one of the concepts that has been talked a lot uh both by the Shieldings guys. I know Millennial Woes has talked about it at length. Um, something that we, it's not feasible yet with capital, but um, it's, uh, you know, we were talking about like mutual aid societies. You know, we, we may not have the capital to have like dissident right insurance to where if you get doxxed or canceled or whatever, then we can cover you, you know, and you'll have some money to take care of yourself until you can find another job. But that would be the, that's sort of our modus operandi right now with a lot of uh, with a lot of Americans uh, for us as well as those across the pond. Like I said, Millennial Woes talked about this at length, um, and God bless him for it. But uh, you know, is the idea that you know first rule of any sort of network right should be no um, no you know no one should be unemployed of our friends right like uh, you know if you get fired because someone doxes your YouTube account or your Twitter or whatever. Um, if you're within this network that we want to, you know, at least some sort of mutual aid society, then we can cover you, right? Like that, that happens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, I should have Paul on to talk about his most recent Civil War posts. Yeah, no, I, I saw him. Uh, I've read both of them now, and I think that and there's, they're good. Uh, he's not the first person to write about these sort of concepts of what's to come. I know that there was a guy... Uh, Charlemagne did a book review on this guy that was predicting that sort of deal. So yeah, I should probably have him on. I know he did an interview with Iron Age Archive as well, but yeah, I can have Paul on. We can definitely talk about it one of these days. Not opposed. Um, but uh, apparently American Populist is having a discussion with him. So um, at least Paul and uh, American Populist on his channel will have that conversation. Let's see here. Um, 
Interesting. Uh, I find it interesting that Prude went towards religion after his illness. Some go to the other direction. It seems uh, to change people to the extreme. Yeah, well, I, I've i talked about it to some degree, both on Substack and on here, but, you know, I, I came from a very agnostic, libertarian political phase when I was younger. I worked within, like, Republican Party phone banking and canvassing. I was an elections judge and all that jazz. And, um, yeah, I didn't really find, I, I was rather not into the whole, you know, Christian conservatism or the evangelical wing of the right wing, uh, in the Republican party. It just didn't, it didn't rub me the right way. I didn't find it to be electorally feasible. Um, in my naivete, of course, they are the most powerful voting bloc within the Republican party in American electoral politics. It's just, I wasn't connected, um, religiously to anything, but, uh, and I think in my haze, uh, in my youth, I was rather destructive towards my own body. I was, uh, quite, I was drinking a lot, like every day, basically after work, when I lived in El Paso, I was going to like a billiards bar just over and over and over again. And they knew my drink order back to back to back, uh, which, you know, once you get into a habit of things it can sometimes lead you in a direction you don't want to go down. But I mean, I've, like I've, I mentioned, um, I think on the post I made about the, the one year anniversary of my transplant, you know, uh, I went to numerous churches before I found my home where I am now with the OCA. I, I did visit, I did go to traditional Latin mass. I did go to Baptists, Pentecostal. I even drove like an hour to go to an Anglican service. Um, I did go to a Lutheran church that was within the LMCS. So I, you know, I was just trying to find my way back. And um, I found my home with the most welcoming people and the most, uh, you know, just, people that helped me understand sort of the, the spiritual sense of where I was going and what's been happening to me in this uh, year of dialysis and waiting and then the transplant, and the life that's come afterwards. And, you know, they've, it's helped me a lot to sort of assuage this um, survivor's guilt that I sort of carry. I mean, it's not gone completely. It's a demon that I battle with daily, but you know, it's always kind of hard when I look at my past self and I try and reconcile, um, you know, this like sort of just womanizing, uh, borderline alcoholic, uh, to, you know, this idea of getting new life. Um, and, but I mean, your youthful veil of, uh, invincibility disappears very quickly. Like I'm very, it's there, but it's not there. Like I'm consciously aware of how easy it is to die, but at the same time, you know, if it wasn't for that veil of invincibility, I don't think I would have gotten it through mentally and spiritually as unscathed, I think, as I did. But I mean, yeah, people find in all sorts of directions where they either lose themselves out of religion or they come back to it. But I mean, to each their own. I mean, I'm whatever your tradition or faith may be. I'm I'm not as sectarian sometimes as maybe I should be. Who knows? But uh, I'm I'm glad that people find their sense of meaning elsewhere and wherever they may be. Um, El Paso, true scum of true hive of scum and villainy. Yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, it does, uh, it does come with it. But, um, I, yeah, I, I, I was, um, I was up there. Um, Milan says, uh, I seemed like a myth, misanthrope elitist apparently the first time. Well, I try not to be, um, I, I try not to be as misanthropic about people. I can sometimes be, I, sometimes you can turn on your Twitter feed or see something and you're just like, oh, well, uh, let the asteroid hit us already, you know, but I, I try to hold a better faith about things. I'm, I, I'm very pro God and country in that regard. So, but I do understand the value of having elites that are about me, but I come from very humble, like background. I'm not like a Ivy league educated so-and-so I work, I live in the middle of nowhere. I work on land and I take care of people, you know, I, I try not to be someone who's, uh, <laughs> try not to be as uh, hoity-toity, you know, that's something I try not to do. But I was definitely pretty libertarian in my younger days. Um, let's see here. I, I missed something about Faust that I, I needed to respond to as an earlier question. Uh, let me see if I can find it now. Da -da 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 -da. Trying to find it. Where did it go? Uh, if I can't find it, then I apologize. I will try and look for it. But yeah, um, it is rough out there. Yeah, it is rough in El Paso. Um, uh, do most transplant recipients go through Survivor's Guild? I wouldn't know, actually, Minoan. I don't talk to a lot of other transplant patients. 
Um, by nature, not everyone, I'm, by all intents and purposes, unless you have like an extreme issue when you're a kid, um, you either need one when you're older in life or something happens like cancer or whatever. But like, uh, you know, I was very young, uh, by all comparison when I was in like the dialysis center, it's all old men or diabetics and I'm not diabetic or old. So it was, um, I was the only one in the, like my mid twenties and I was being taken care of by nurses that were my age, but I don't talk to any of them. I go through it because the, I received a pediatric transplant and my donor was nine months old when he died. That's why I go through some sense of survivor's guilt that this little boy is dead and didn't get to have a life. And um, I get to live this one now. And I feel very weighed down, I think, by the sense of the past of what I've got. But yeah, uh, I don't talk to too many. I don't know if they do. I would imagine that they do. Um, yeah. Uh, but those are just parts of... Um, Oh yeah, I, I, Vingol. I'm. I'm. Well, maybe I should. Let me go. Just scroll up for that for Faust. Control F. But yeah, I mean that's my life that's going on right now. I know that this lecture was a little uh, shorter than usual, um, but do not worry. I've got the next one already outlined, and we're probably going to go on the PowerPoint slides alone. Will probably be like an hour and a half. So that one will probably be a two-hour stream. Everybody. So um, I apologize if this one was a little shorter than usual. But uh, da, 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 trying to find. I'm on, uh, what's the issue here? I'm on uh, the StreamYards bit here, so who knows? But I'll, I'll find it, don't worry. Um, I look like I turned 20. Well, I'm, I'm blessed by uh, good looks but uh, and being young, but also because... Um, uh, just, I, I, my running gag about my, about looking younger than I actually am. And it's partially the reason why I grow out this God awful mustache is so I don't look like I'm 15 is, um, I, I would jokingly tell when I like go check in for like the DMV or, uh, you know, even the transplant clinic, there's this lovely, um, uh, black nurse that will help me uh, sign in and get all my forms filled out. And I remember the first time I went there, she had commented that I said that I look incredibly young because I handed her my driver's license. I didn't have any facial hair at the time. And um, she was like, well, you look very young to be 25. And I was like, well, I just take a, you know, I, I took a line out of y'all's playbook and I just moisturize and that got her laughing like nobody's business. So, you know, I, I, this just tells me I'll look great at 40. Who knows? And I mean, my grandfather is 83 years old and he doesn't look a day over like 60. So that helps a lot. Oh, thank you. You, you definitely re you added your comment again. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I can't compare to the, what servicemen went through, but just, um, you know, again, I, I appreciate what you've done for, I know it's always weird to say thank you for your service, but it's, I mean, I, my father hates it and he it was in the army for 30 years, but like, you know, for people that actually did like the, the front line or, and, you know, saw combat and stuff like that. Yeah. I can only imagine what that's like, but it does just mean that we have to live our lives fully. And that's exactly what I intend to do. Ah, there we go. There's the, thank you for asking it again. Um, Faust ultimately and predictively lost everything because of his recklessness, despite multiple divine intercessions. Why would the Faustian spirit be something for the West to emulate? Um, so, I mean, Spengler's interpretation of like the West is Faustian man is by the desire to know and to conquer and to be all, uh, we, we look towards the infinite. Um, so, you know, uh, there are many Christians that would say the, the, the infinite of understanding or to be with God and understand its mysteries, it, it, you know, things that we cannot be dedicate our full life to. There are some Christians that say that, um, to be Faustian man is just to stand in for what he means to be Christian. But, um, you know, the, what he mean, what Spangler refers to is by like this Faustian spirit is just this, you know, always looking towards the horizon. We're always conquering. We're always looking to understand and to know the beyond and that we make deals with this knowledge to, to know that our, our prices to pay for it. Um, and that when Faust and eventually with Faust, once you run out of that creativity, we burn out. Um, I mean, the, the, it is innately part of what the West is. Um, is it something for the West to emulate? I mean, yes, I, it's part of who we are. I think and this is where I would agree with Spangler that in many ways we are Faustian. Um, 
Because once we stop being creative or we stop looking towards the horizon, once we've stopped thinking that there are, once we start being lamenting, like there are no more worlds to conquer, things get stagnant very quickly. And I think it's sort of why we get to where we are now. Um, I mean, I think about there, you know, culture seems when, when we talk about like the end of history, right. With Fukuyama, it's not just the like universality and the applicability of this like Anglo-American style liberalism towards the rest of the world, which clearly didn't work. Right. But also because, it felt it feels like an end of history because there is this once we stopped being creative and we, we things sort of just started to get very flat culturally speaking like things got very dull things got very boring things got very rough after um the the, the late 90s i really think you know a lot of tv shows they just stuck to a formula a lot of culture i think of um you know the flat corporate people design just sort of this death of looking towards the horizon and creativity. Um, and I think that we sort of need to snap ourselves out of that. And that's why, you know, there's always this debate or this discussion all the time, right? Where, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like we're, we're, like the, the right-wing art discussion, like the, the whole debate over the um, I am underscore 1776 stuff, you know, like uh, you know, what is dissident art supposed to be? Is it explicitly political? Should it not be right-wing? Good art doesn't have to be right-wing. I mean, we're trying to get ourselves back towards creativity, and I think that that's good. Um, I think it's part of the what, what the West is. Um, there's just no, there's not a lot of soul to a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely what it is. Um, Felix Fairmount says that I should pick ties for each show. Oh, man. So I have um, an ungodly number of ties. So if you'd like, ladies and gents... Um, uh, I can pull a, I can pull something out of Radlib's book and we'll pick a new tie for each stream and whatnot. Um, <laughs> necktie and bow tie. We can definitely do that. So something to keep in mind. But uh, yeah. Um, oh, send for favorite ties. Well, I don't have a, I don't have a PO box yet. So no, don't send me anything just yet. Um, frog ties on the shop. Well, I don't know if Teespring does neckties or anything like that, but that would be pretty cool. But we are working on a hat. But um, so next week is going to be on his time in Russia, Yugoslavia, and his time in the Cold War and his influence and in policy papers towards the uh, policy of containment and his criticisms of others. During that time frame where we really get to see Kennan's realism come into full form, um, we'll talk about his memoirs and his works in the third stream. But um, I already have my notes outlined for the next one. And man, oh man, um, it's going to be a very long discussion. So it'll be a long lecture. I hope that you get used to my voice. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all um, for tuning in. I know that this was a shorter introduction to Kennan's early life education and his time during the Second World War, but we're going to kick it off um, with the Marshall Plan, Russia, the Long Telegram. We're going to read a lot about the Long Telegram, and we're going to go into it in depth. And then, you know, his time outside of the Foreign Service in the Cold War. So all that being said, I hope that you all have a fantastic Sunday, a great beginning to your week. I have a lot of things in store for you guys, and um, I'll see you all next time. Take care, everybody, and be prudent. See ya.